Welcome to Reflection Church, everyone. Stand up with us and let's worship. How do I say thank you, Lord, for the way that you love and the way that you come, for all that you've done. And all that you'll do, my heart pours out. Thank you. You don't have to come, but you always do. You show up in. Splendor and change the whole room. You don't have to come, but you always do. You show up in splendor and change the whole room. How do I say thank you, Lord, for the life that you gave, and the cross that you bore, for the love you pour out to ransom my
redemption in his heart. Oh, we worship such a powerful God, such a miracle working God. Let's lift up a hand clap of praise to our God. to me. 
You're my God of miracles. I believe in you. We believe in you. Cause you're a God of miracles. Oh. And we believe. in this day just like you said you would your word is not in vain our hearts reaching heaven word fresh Yeah. Hey. 
Unleash a fresh outpouring now. We need a fresh outpouring. Unleash a fresh outpouring now. We need a fresh outpouring. Unleash a fresh outpouring now. We need a fresh outpouring. Unleash a fresh outpouring now. gates of heaven let it rain and let it rain open the flood gates of heaven let it rain well, let's cry this out together let it rain every voice
let it rain open the floodgates of heaven let it rain let it rain open the floodgates of heaven let Would you rend the heavens and come down? We stand under the open heaven that Jesus stood under at his baptism. When the heavens open, the Father said, This is the Son that I love and the one that I'm well pleased at. We thank you that the heavens that split on the Mount of Transfiguration the overwhelming cloud of God's presence that came and rested on that great mountain. We say come in that manner. Tear open the skies and dwell with us, Lord. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, the Bible says that he took a cup and he took bread and He instituted the Lord's Supper on that night. The Bible says that when he took the bread, he blessed it and he broke it. If you remember John chapter 6, when he had blessed the bread and when he had broken it, it multiplied. And in the same way that the physical bread multiplied, so the bread of his body multiplies spiritually to all who would partake for generations and generations and generations. That's why today we can come at the table and partake in the real presence of the Lord Jesus comes with us. And in like manner, the Bible says that he took a cup and he said, this is my blood. Pour it out for you. Pour it out for the sins of men. Pour it out for your sins. Pour it out for my sins. So that the abundant flow of his forgiveness and the abundant flow of his mercy and the abundant flow of his spirit could come and pour into our hearts. The body and the blood of Jesus. I'm going to go ahead and ask our Eucharist servers to to come and prepare the elements and get ready. And I'm going to give a few words of instruction. If you want to remain standing or be seated or whatever posture you want to be in, we're about to come to the table. I'll leave that to you. Here at Reflection Church, we have a common loaf and a common cup. Praise the Lord, we don't all drink from that same cup. Hallelujah. Some of y'all are stressed. I would be too. I've been to a few churches that do just drink from the same cup, and I'm always first in line. here we we have pieces of bread pre-cut and you'll take one of those pieces of bread and you'll dip it into the cup you don't want to dip your fingers in it if you've dipped your fingers in it you've dipped too far but you'll take a piece of bread and you'll gently dip it in the cup and then you'll eat of that immediately you don't have to wait till everybody's dipped because then it'll be dripping everywhere and all over the place you can just dip and then immediately partake in that but before we move into partaking Paul is very clear with instruction on readiness to get around the table and not to partake in a manner unworthy meaning we're not partaking and we're not doing this lightly this is the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus 
and we do this in remembrance. That term means not only a past event. See, this is what I love about the nuance of of the Greek language. It it not only means I'm going to think about a past event. It means I'm going to look forward to a present moment where we'll eat again at the marriage supper of the lamb and he'll have the cup of the of the vine and he'll have the bread with us there at his great banquet table it means to take the past and to take the future moment and to bring it right here into the present and to experience the past blessings the future promises and the present realities available today we sing about miracles We sang about the outpouring of the Spirit. All that's provided by His broken body and His poured out blood. All of it. All of it. It's finished right there. It's completed. And so I'm going to take a moment now before we dismiss you. And I'll let parents, I'll let kids be to your discretion if you believe they're ready or not. We certainly believe that the Lord Jesus can save kids at a young age and they can participate at the table. But I'll leave that to your discretion. And we'll let that take place. But you know, and we'll trust your discernment on that. We just ask that you're a believer in Jesus Christ. That's the only stipulation that we have. You're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and partake at his table. Let's just take a moment now and in his presence, let's just allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts. And if there's any impure way, if there's any unclean thing in us, let's let the Holy Spirit search that out, find it. Reveal that, and let's repent of it. Let's repent of it, just as Lucky keeps playing. As he so beautifully does. Father, search us. Reveal impurities. Reveal uncertainties. Reveal sins. Reveal hidden things. Shine your light on them, Lord Jesus. Shine your light on them, Lord Jesus. Make them known to us. Forgive us. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleanse us, Lord Jesus. Cleanse us, Lord Jesus. I'm going to ask at this time if... Our ushers will begin dismissing from back to front. So these two sections will come and partake here, and these two sections will come and partake here. And what you'll do, you'll get in a tight-knit circle together so that you can hear the prayer of blessing. But what I want specifically and what we're contending for and believing for is that there will be miracles at this table today, miracles in His presence, miracles of healing, miracles of forgiveness, miracles of relationships of 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 mindsets of anxiety of depression of fears healing of all kind that when you partake his body and blood heals you by faith so come to the table today in faith and in trust that he's healing you and then our eucharist servers are going to pray a prayer of healing over you when you come so ushers if you'll begin dismissing now
sing this chorus together. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. No precious is the flow that makes me white as no no other fount I know nothing but the blood of Jesus just lift our needs to the Lord right now as we sing this what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that Here's the thing about the blood of Jesus. It's only good if you apply it. Guess where the death angel went to every house where the blood was not applied. The blood of the lamb had been spilled, but to every house it had not been applied to. The promise of his covering and protection was not experienced. We have to learn how to apply the blood of Jesus to our families, to our homes, to our hearts and our minds and our lives to experience the benefits of his poured out blood on us. Hallelujah. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Well, our kiddos are going to be with us today, all the children. we got several folks in children's ministry sick today, so we figured we had better not spread all that goodness and kindness to all you families. So, so know that our attempt and our aim is to bless you with not getting the stomach bug and, and not... Uh, not make it too tough on you today. So, hey, we are called the body of Christ, and the children are part of the body of Christ. So it's okay. We don't have to. We, I said this morning in, in, our, in our ministry time, I don't know any other body where you decapitate a part and put it off in the side and then not miss it. Y'all get that at lunch. A little grotesque. It's okay. But we are excited and grateful that our, that our children are with us here today. And parents, I, I know that this week you'll be happy that they're not throwing up and sick. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm in Acts chapter 9 today. And so while I'm giving some of these preliminary thoughts and some of these preliminary uh, kind of administrative items for our service, I want you to go ahead and turn in your Bibles there to Acts chapter 9. But in this atmosphere, I want to give the opportunity to bless you and the Lord with our giving. You know, this is the only space that God invites us to test Him in. 
It's a very interesting phraseology that the Lord gives when he gives us the opportunity to test him in this. I don't know if you've ever tested the Lord in your giving, but what I can tell you is I've never had an experience where I didn't see, taste, and see, experience the faithfulness of God when I honored his covenant of tithe. I don't say this to toot my horn or to get a reward in it because when you go and tell people what you do, you lose your reward. But what I'm saying is the area of tithe is something that Tiffany and I have been faithful to. And I've never seen the righteous forsaken or begging for bread. When you honor this, I'm not talking about leftovers. I'm talking about priority. I'm talking about making a shift to honor him first with our giving, our first fruits, our best. I'm telling you, the Lord has a way of returning that. We do not give to get. It's a byproduct of honoring him. If you give to get, you're doing something wrong. If your motive in giving is, I hope I get more than what I've given and I'm only giving to get money or to get blessings or to get this, that's not a joyful giver or a pure heart that we're giving out of. I want to thank you for your faithfulness in giving. In this year, we're doing better this year financially than we've done. In the past three years, we're better right now at six months in than we've ever been. And I, I, I thank God for that because it enables opportunity. It enables some things to start opening up. So thank you so much for that. If you are giving, you can give on the app. You can give online at reflection.church. You can give a cash or check, giving envelopes on the row in front of you, and the offering plate is buy these double doors on your way out so you can drop in your offering right there. So let me just say a prayer, a, a blessing over the gift that you give and over your life that the Lord would bless you. So Father, thank you that we get to give today. We don't do it out of obligation or because you make us or because you're going to be bad to us if we, if we don't. We, we give because we get to. We give with great joy in our hearts. We give with enthusiasm and excitement that we get to do this. We get to give you our best portion. We get to worship you with every area of our life. Thank you, Lord, that we get to worship you in every area, not just singing to you, but giving to you, being faithful to you in every area. Father, bless every giver here today. Abundantly, richly, kindly, undeservingly, bless them. Pour out the open heaven over their life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We do have a men's, uh, another men's, we said we were doing a men's breakfast every month. We do have a men's breakfast coming up this Saturday at 8 a.m. Another men's breakfast this Saturday at 8 a.m. It'll be here at the church. So all you men, you're welcome to come. Come at 8. We're going to dive into the Word together. We're going to eat some good food together. And we're going to just enjoy each other's company and grow together in God. Amen. So the summer months are a little bit tricky, so it's kind of touch and go. Let me, let me give you a, a quick update on the process of our, our building and our offer and all the things. Y'all still see the for sale signs up, so let me just give you a quick update. I try to give updates as soon as I get them. We, we, our, our, our offer for the other property was approved, contingent upon us selling our building, and we're still in that time period where we're attempting to sell the building. There is more interest. There are uh, some very viable interests that have been uh, made, and there are also new inquiries that have come in over the last few days, and some more inquiries that are on their way. Word is continuing to spread. It takes a minute for all the different folks to know who, that a building's for sale and what that looks like, especially when it's listed for the amount it is. Not anybody can just come and buy it. Uh, so it takes a certain set of finances in a certain situation in time. But, but we're just praying and believing that whatever God would want to do with this property uh, would be blessed. Whoever wants to come. Uh, I, I was reminded this week from a dear prophetic friend. I won't give the whole detail. But, I, but I'll say this. I was reminded that sometimes God will position someone on a land as, as kind of a squatter, as kind of an interim. Think of the Canaanites. They were in God's promised land, and they were kind of holding it on reserve until the Israelites were ready and got out of slavery and finished wandering the desert. So sometimes God has a way of sovereignly 
having someone purchase a property and kind of hold it for his ultimate purpose. So we're just praying that whatever needs to happen in this interim time, the Lord would honor that and bless whoever it would be as we continue to have faith for what we sense God calling us into. So this week, I want you to join me in prayer and fasting, if you would, for the will of the Lord to be done and for anyone who needs to buy this property that they would see it, feel it, and do it. So that's what, that's what we're praying and believing for. I have a lot of other things to say uh, about that in, as in the coming weeks, but I, I tell you that a lot of the events that we have are kind of on hold for a minute because I get calls all the time. Hey, this person wants to see the building. Hey, they're driving from Tulsa. Hey, I got a company coming from Norman. Hey, I went. So, so I, I, we kind of have our services, and then we kind of have the pause button on some of our events, but we do have some kids' events planned this summer and some uh, some fellowship-centered events and some teaching events and some prayer and worship events and things, but we're kind of waiting for the next 10 to 15 days because we just don't know what all that process looks like as it pans out. So we're trying to do our best to keep the building as open and as clean. Come on, somebody. It's hard to keep an 18,705 square foot building clean for showings. You know, it's one thing to have a 1,500 square foot house clean for somebody to drop in. It's a whole nother ball game when you multiply that times about 15. So so that, that's, that's kind of why there's a little bit of a, a pause. We're not stopping any events, but we're just trying to be as wise as we can and create as much space for people wanting to, to view and come and see as possible. So just that's an update there. So uh, now that you've got your Bibles open to Acts chapter 9, I want to welcome everybody who's joining us online, on demand, or whenever you do. Uh, yeah. On our YouTube account, we have anywhere from 40 to 80 people a week who watch our services. And then on our app, we have about 15 to 20 who watch our services. So on any given week, there's about 100 folks who are joining with us. So if you're in the area, come on out while we're still here in this building. Um, come on out. Come see us. We'll let you know if we change addresses. We won't leave you hanging. But we're, we're really glad that you're able to to be with us in, in whatever modality you can. Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 19. I've been stewing on this since uh, about 2018. If I don't have something to say today, I'm in trouble. The Holy Spirit's been kind of driving this deep into my heart, into my spirit over the last five or so years. And, and there's been some kind of some fresh revelation with it, and I want to give that and impart that to you today from Acts chapter 9. This is week 6. I don't do the series a month thing. If God wants me to preach something for 40 years, I'll do it. I don't care. I don't care. Um, I, that's, that's just not what I'm bound to. I, I try to be bound to Christ. And I, I just sense his pause and his hovering over this, this thematic thread of they shall prophesy and the outpouring of the Spirit. And so I'm just praying that some of this may be new revelation. Uh, Pastor Joel Solomon, who comes here and ministers frequently, he says sometimes some things are new and some things are just true. Sometimes we need to be reminded of what's true and sometimes the Holy Spirit will show us something new. But one way or the other, I'm praying you're reminded of it. My daughter's locked in right now. She's ready. She's locked. So Acts chapter 9 verses 10 through 19. I'm reading from ESV. The words of this are on the screen. If you're watching online, they're on the lower thirds of the screen. Now there was a disciple. Somebody say disciple. That's critical. There was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, this is not Judas Iscariot. Judas was a common name. It's another Judas. Look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. Saul is Paul's Hebrew name, and Paul Paulos is his Greek and Roman name. So he didn't change his names. It's just a different cultural, it's just an aside. It's going to take me an hour to get through the text if I keep doing this. 
Look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision. So Ananias has had a vision and Saul's had a vision. A man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered his, the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes. And he regained his sight. And then he rose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. I want to speak to you today from this subject, living a prophetic life. Living a prophetic life. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live a mamby-pamby, boring, Christianese, check-a-box life. I want to live a prophetic life. I want to live led by the Spirit. For the sons of God, Romans 8, 14, are those who are led by the Spirit of God. The children of God are led by the Spirit of God. To live a prophetic life means to be led by the Spirit of God. So I, 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 in discussing the role of prophecy and the Trinity's gifts to his body and the body of Christ, it's easy to get in the mindset and in the framework of thinking that these gifts, these things only happen for super apostles, super Christian leaders, staff pastors, people who've lived in the prayer room for 40 years, and that if you want the Trinity's gifts to flow through you, you kind of either have to be in a, a ministry position, or you've got to be some kind of uh, apostolic leader, or, or you've got to be somebody like one of the people in the New Testament, like the 12 disciples of Jesus, and people have gotten kind of a misconception about the Trinity's gifts because they already count themselves out before it even starts. They already say, well, that's for that group, but not for me, and so we discount the possibility of living a prophetic life and say, that's just for pastors, that's just for worship leaders, that's just for missionaries, that's just for if you go on a ministry trip, but I'm talking about an everyday prophetic life is what we can enter into and what the Holy Spirit can do in you. This story, this real factual historical account describes to us what kind of what I call a template or a paradigm or a descriptor of what it means to live this kind of life, not just for a pastor or a staff person or a missionary, but for a believer anytime, any place, any day. This is the level of openness, willingness, and readiness that Christ is looking for. This is what Jesus wants for your life living a prophetic life. And Ananias gives us some keys. He enables us and unveils for us what that reality looks like. Because a prophetic life does not mean a denomination. Pentecostal, charismatic is not about a denomination. It's about being biblical. This is about living a biblical life, not a Pentecostal life or a charismatic life, but a biblical life. That's what it means to live a prophetic life. So we're just going to walk through this text and allow the truths within to emerge and impact deeply our hearts today and what it means to live a prophetic life. So let's look at verse 10 here. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Write this down. Ananias was a disciple. 
Ananias was a disciple. Ananias was not a, what, the text does not say he was a pastor. The text does not say he was an apostolic leader. The text does not say he led a home church. The text says he was a disciple. This is great news for you. This is great news for me. I know I'm a pastor. That's the vocational calling on my life and the office that God has called me to. But before I'm a pastor, I'm a disciple. I was a disciple before I was a pastor, and I'll be a disciple long after my pastoral vocation ends when that time comes or when the Lord Jesus comes back. He won't need pastors in heaven. He's the light of that city. We'll all be priesting and ministering unto the Lord. We are disciples first and foremost. I'm a disciple before I'm a husband. I'm a disciple before I'm a father. I'm a disciple before I'm an employee. I'm a disciple before I'm an employer. And that reality and that distinction enables you to do all of those things well. And when you place other things before that, you will do none of them well. Well, we're still in the introduction almost, and we're already getting... I wore some thick boots today, so I hope I might do a little bit of stomping here, and that's okay. Be blessed. No, but, but we have no information about Ananias' life. We don't know about his family. We don't know about his church situation. We don't know any. There's no precursor. There's no, hey, here's an annotated bibliography on the life of Ananias. Ananias was a disciple. That's, that's all that the text records. Now, the impact and influence of Ananias on Saul was so significant that when Saul is recounting his testimony before people in Acts 22.12, he mentions that Ananias was a man of good reputation and who was devout. A disciple, those are great descriptors of what it means to be a disciple. Devout means you are faithful to the word of God, the ways of God, the place of prayer, the practices of being a disciple. A disciple means, it's, the term is mathetes, which means student. Every disciple was a student of the rabbi. And they learned how to walk like him and talk like him and teach like him and pray like him and act like him. And that is our aim as students of the rabbi. He is our teacher. He is our master. He is our Lord. And we want to walk like him and talk like him and act like him and think like him and process like him and pray like him. We want to be exactly like him. That's what it means to be a Christian. They were not first called Christians until Antioch in Acts 13 where they were first called Christians, little Christs. Primarily they were followers of the way or disciples. That's why I'm not interested if you identify as a Christian. I want to know if you're a student. I want to know if you sit in the dust of the rabbi's feet. I want to know if you dwell in his presence and you act like him and you think like him and you talk like him and you pray like him. I know people who do, and it's easy to tell when you meet a student of the rabbi. Oh, it's different than somebody who's nominal in their faith and checks the box of Christian on the survey for Barna. A student of the rabbi, you know them when you see them. Ananias was a pupil. He was an apprentice. He was a student of Jesus. And every prophetic gifting, every ounce of living a prophetic life is predicated upon being a pupil of Jesus. You cannot live prophetically if you are not his pupil or his student. You cannot flow in his leadership and in his, in his river, if you will, if you are not married to his teaching and his thinking and his ways and you listen to his words and you invest time with him and you're faithful to him. And if prophecy is a, an unveiling of a communication of the heart and mind of God to people, how else can you know his heart and mind other than sitting under his teaching? How else do you know his heart and mind other than getting in the secret place and listening and hearing him? How else do you know his heart and mind and can communicate that unless you are a disciple? Now here is the kind of the, the punch. I've seen prophetic people who have no integrity. 
I've seen prophetic people who can prophesy an address and don't know how to live for God at all. I've seen people who can say, you've got three kids and the Lord says you're going to have a fourth and then, and then they go off into the green room and, and talk vulgar and act crude and, and have no intimacy with Jesus. Matthew seven twenty one through 22. And they will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And he'll say, depart from me, you doers of evil. I never knew you. The prophetic gift in its truest form is not just about revelation, but it's about the depth of intimacy and investment with Jesus. Now, here's what bothers me, though. And, and, and I just listened to a message from Randy Clark, and he kind of uh, highlighted this, and it's just been burning within me this week. Some people overemphasize the gift and underemphasize character. That's wrong. Some people overemphasize character. I'm not saying that that can really be done, but what I'm saying is they say, I don't really care about any gifts. I just want character. That's wrong. You want both. You want an increase of gifts and an increase of character. You want both. It's both and, not either or. Saying I want character and not gifts is not noble. That doesn't make you a better Christian. <laughs> That's disobeying the mandate of 1 Corinthians 14 of earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So to say I just want character and I don't want to pursue any gifts is not a biblical framework. But we should be pursuing Christ-like character and not being enamored just by gifts and let character sink. We've got way too much. I'm, I'm tired. I'm, I'm so tired. And I say this in all humility and uh, all reality, that, but by the grace of God, so go I. But I am so tired of seeing believers at big stages collapsing and disgracing the name of Christ. I'm, I'm, I'm grieved by it. I'm, I'm tired of it. We need character, but we also need gifting. We need both. Disciples understand that. I'm going to, be, I'm going to live in cruciformity. That means I'm going to take on the image of the crucified Christ and allow him to transform me uh, with humility and graciousness and kindness and gentleness. But I'm also going to flow in the power of Christ and his spirit and his gifts that he gives to his body. That's what it means to be a disciple. Now, if Ananias was not a man of good reputation, then his deep a meaningful encounter with Saul could have been jeopardized because Saul, as the pharisaical leader that he was, as the studied scholar that he was, could have easily said, well, that must not have been a genuine encounter because this man's life does not verify the message that he sends. How troubling that many prophetic words that have been from the Lord have been second-guessed because people's character has been so low. People's lives have lived so far beneath the gift of prophecy. And yet, Ananias was a man of good reputation. Nobody in the town had anything to grab on. The, the term that's used in Scripture is actually like the imagery of a pole that one would climb, almost like a ladder. Uh, and, and, and to have character or good reputation means that there are no rungs to grab onto. No rungs of accusation that anybody can grab onto on the, on the pole of your life. There are no rungs to climb and say, oh, but that, and oh, but that. And when we live in that kind of manner, and we live with that kind of integrity, it enables when God uses us in prophetic gifts and other gifts of the Holy Spirit to be believable. People don't have questions about it in the same way that they do if you have no integrity or faithfulness to Christ. So Ananias and this experience he had with Saul was able to be so transformative and so impactful because he was a man of character. And his prophetic gift as a true disciple was able to be leveraged for the purposes of the Lord. Ananias was a disciple, are you? I didn't ask if you prayed a prayer. I did not ask if you recited words after someone. I said, are you a student of the rabbi? Are you one to sit at his feet? Are you one to be impacted by his words? 
These are the questions that we need to ask ourselves before we move into the giftings and callings that Christ would have for us. Praise God. I know there are disciples in here. Come on. I know there are people who sit at his feet. But today I want us to be challenged by the example of Ananias that we too need a new commitment to sit at the rabbi's feet as a student before we start going out and trying to do all of the charismatic ministry of the Spirit. Ananias was a disciple. There's something else that transpired in Ananias' life in verses 10 through 16. In the second part of verse 10, the Lord said to Ananias in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. How many of you know that the Lord Jesus knows your address? He knows where you live. He knows your P.O. box. If he wants to send you a letter, he knows where to get it to. The street called Straight was, would be like a very familiar and famous street here in, in the area of Damascus. It, it was a very common street, so it wasn't this obscure place. Ananias, as someone living in the area, knew exactly where Jesus was telling him to go. But then he said, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he's seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go. Go. This is what he told to Moses. Go. By the way, my daughter is a Wookiee. If she does this thing. She, she knows I like Star Wars. So the Lord just go ahead, went ahead and blessed me. So if you hear Wookiee sounds and gurgling, it's my daughter. If you're watching online, that's what's happening. I may join in with her here in a minute. Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Write this down. Ananias was open. Ananias was open. Are you open? Are, are you open to the ministry of the Holy Spirit? Are you open to dreams? Are you open to visions? Are you open to him ruining your schedule? Are you open to him telling you to go somewhere that you don't want to go? This is biblical discipleship. This isn't for the leader of the church of Jerusalem and the apostle Paul and this and that. This is Ananias. He's just a disciple. He's just in the city, living for Jesus, good reputation, faithful to God, and God says, I'm picking you. And Ananias was open. Old and New Testament alike emphasize the nature of visions in Revelation from God. Visions are a common and familiar experience of Revelation. If you've never had a vision before, I'm praying that you do. In the last days, says God, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and there will be dreams and visions and prophecy. Some, uh, Lou Engel, when he was in an interview once, uh, he was asked about dreams and visions, and, and he said a lot of people come up to him and say, it was just a dream. It was just a dream. Uh, and and I, I put before you, that's the language of the Holy Spirit often. And when we treat it so cavalierly and so unimportantly, and well, that was probably just some bad pizza I ate and weird something and something awkward and weird and that, that's not. There are dreams that the Holy Spirit wants to give. And one of the things that I've started doing, I put a notepad by my nightstand. And I wake up in the middle of the night and I record the dreams he gives. And every night I pray over Tiffany and Rama and myself that the Lord would give us dreams and visions. Every single night. Sometimes I have the weirdest dreams that definitely aren't from God. It's called there's too much information in my brain, and there's a psychological reality called a flush that takes place. These aren't the technical terms. But your brain has to create space, so it flushes it through some dreams. Okay, And there's a weird conglomeration of things that happen, and it's just strange dreams that have nothing to do with God communicating to us. Okay, 
Every dream is not from God, so don't, don't let that be the takeaway. But some are. Some are. I wonder what would have happened with Daniel's visions and dreams if he would have said it, it was just a dream. I wonder about Joseph. Joseph said, what was meant for evil, God has redeemed for good so that many shall be saved. That's Genesis 50, 20. I wonder if Joseph and his coat of many colors and his dream to rise to elevation and power and promise, his dreams to rightly interpret prophetically the cupbearer and the baker, I wonder if he would have just said, it's just a dream. What would have happened to the Hebrew people? Maybe God raises up another dreamer. I wonder if Isaiah in Isaiah 6 1, he had a throne room vision. It's one of the most famous. I wonder if he just would have said, It's just a dream. Probably doesn't mean anything. What about Ezekiel who had great visions? What about so many of the prophets who had so many visions and dreams? What if they would have said, It's just a dream. I probably shouldn't write it down. What if Joseph and Mary, when the Lord Jesus through Angels and messengers came and visited them and spoke that you're going to have a son and you're going to name him Jesus and he's going to save people from their sins. What if they would have said, it's just a dream? It doesn't matter. What if Elizabeth and John, or Zechariah, excuse me, Elizabeth and Zechariah, who had John the Baptist when, when God had visited them through dreams and visions, what if they said, it's just a dream? What if Peter, when he was released from prison and, and, and the servant girl came and opened the door and everybody said, you're probably just seeing a vision, it's just a dream. What if they would have left Peter out there and he would have gotten caught? What if Paul, when he heard Jesus and the spirit of Jesus forbade him to go through Macedonia and said, you need to, or through Bithynia and Asia and said, you need to go toward Macedonia? What if he would have said, it's just a dream? That travel and his missionary journey determined the direction that the gospel would go in going toward Europe and ultimately North America. If he would have went the other way, the gospel would have primarily went to China and Asia. But in God's divine sovereignty, he said, I want it spread this direction. And if Paul would have said, no, I think I know what I need to do. That's just a weird dream. I just had pizza. The New Testament and Old Testament followers of Yahweh and of Jesus never treated dreams and visions with disdain. The Lord said, he said this. He said in Numbers chapter 12, verse 6, I speak to my prophets through visions and dreams. The prophetic life must be open to visitations at the night. We must open our lives and our hearts and our minds to the Lord speaking to us through dreams and visions. Some of the most significant things in the last days, Lou Engel, who I mentioned before, said the last days language of the Holy Spirit is dreams and visions. You need to get a notepad. You need to get it by your bed, and you need to beg God to speak to you through dreams and visions because he wants to. He wants to, and you write it down. Some things I've written down are the craziest things, and others are so scary in their accuracy, it blows my mind. I write it all down, and I just begin to prayerfully seek. Now, again, we're not naive. We discern, and we test everything. I'm not going to preach last week's sermon there are three ways to test, and you can go back and, and look at that in the, in the message. On YouTube, those are hyperlinked. Like they're, they're, uh, the sections of the sermon are hyperlinked at the bottom, so you can click on a specific part. In the app, it's just all present in there. When visions come, when dreams come, Ananias teaches that a disciple's only response is yes. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. Yes. This is the same thing that Isaiah said in Isaiah 6. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. When a disciple receives a message from their teacher, they say yes. They say, 
I know that I had plans today. Maybe he said, maybe he had plans to go to the market and buy some things and had dinner plans. And the, and the, and the master said, no, 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 no. I need you to go to the street called Straight. And I need you to go to Saul of Tarsus. And I need you to lay hands on him. And I need you to see healing flow through your hands. And I need your ministry to see him baptized in the Holy Spirit. I need your hands to baptize him. I need you today. I'm messing up your schedule. Are you willing to be interrupted? Are you willing to get off schedule? Are you willing to have him speak? Here's the thing about dreams and visions and prophetic information. When it comes, it demands a response. And and one of the reasons many people do not receive that instruction is because they've already said no before they hear. There's a heart posture of no. My life, my schedule, my agenda, no thank you. I like it. Did you know the the term repent not only means the changing of one's mind, but it literally means the changing of one's agenda. In in, uh, antiquity, they've discovered some correspondence between uh, different commoners, Just, just like if we were to write a Facebook post today and we were to write on somebody's wall or we were to send out a tweet. They, they, they found, out some, found some letters. And, and the term for repent is metanoia. And the term when it was used in language, in conversational language, one to another, there was a correspondence that was found and, and two individuals were trying to schedule a meeting. They were trying to schedule a time together. And what the term metanoia meant in the correspondence was, I need you to get off your schedule and get on to mine. I need you to stop with your timeline, your schedule, and get on to mine. That's why Jesus' first sermon in Mark 1, 14 and 15 was, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is here and now. Repent. Get off your time. Get off your schedule. Get off your thinking and get on to mine. And believe or entrust your whole life to the gospel. Jesus' first message in the first gospel written. This is what disciples do. They say, yes. Here I am. Yes, to the Lord. The prophetic life requires a response to the word of the Lord because he's already prepared the way beforehand, Ephesians 2, that we should walk in them. Saul's already gotten, in in charismatic terms, wrecked by the Lord. He already got He already got knocked off his path toward Damascus. A bright, blinding light has shone in the resurrected, radiant, glorified Jesus who has appeared to him, blinded him, and messed up his theology so bad that he can't move from a house. Now, before you think this is just some weird, ecstatic experience, this is a very rational, intelligent man. He had a Ph.D. in theology. He had most of the Old Testament memorized. He was devout and blameless in accordance to the law. This is Philippians chapter 3. He was from the right tribe at the right time with the right credentials. This was not just some weird person in the community who, who falls off a path and says, I've seen a light. We all have met those. Bless them, Lord. You'll laugh at that when you listen to it again. Amen. So, so, so this is a very uh, verified source, a very uh, believable source, somebody who, who's, who has a great grasp and a knowledge, and, and now he's been humbled, though. Because the only way into the kingdom, this is the Beatitudes, is that you are poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The only way in is to humble yourself and describe and declare your need for Jesus and that you can't do it by yourself, and that you have to have him. And Paul thought that by his intellect, his faithfulness, his keeping in accordance to the law, he didn't need any help, he didn't need anyone, and the light of God shone to him, blinded him, and made him realize, I've messed up. I need him. I have to have him. I've got to have him. And, and, and what's happened here is that now Ananias is on one end and he's received a vision. And Saul's on the other end and he's received a vision. Why? Because God loves speaking through dreams and visions. And so here Saul is banking on Ananias coming. 
God has already given him a, a, I like to think of visions like a, like a cinematic commercial in your, in your mind's eye, right? There's like this sense of you've seen something that's not happened yet, but that is to come, and God has kind of narrated it almost like a commercial. I think that's probably what the experience was like. I'm not going to uh, kind of guess on this because I wasn't there for Saul, but, but in the description, he's gotten detail. He said, there's a man, Ananias. He's going to come in. He's going to lay your hands on you. And here's Ananias. A- and what if Ananias says, this is just a dream. I'm busy. I don't want to do this. The entire prophetic ministry of Paul as an apostle to the Gentiles could be at stake. Millions of lives are at stake here throughout human history for a disciple to listen to the rabbi. You don't know what's at stake when he says, turn the car around. You don't know what's at stake when he says, go and call that person. You don't know what is at stake for generations by being faithful to a single vision, dream, or word from the Lord. Disciples respond with, here I am. Here I am, even when they don't understand it all, when it doesn't all make sense, they say, here I am, here I am. Now, I, I, I want you to, to really grasp the specificity of this prophetic experience. Sometimes we relegate prophecy to, I have a sense that this is what's going on, and I see this happening and that in very vague and general terms, and And sometimes there are more vague and general prophetic words given, but God also really likes details. He really likes specifics. He really likes to dig down into the integrity of the situation and demonstrate this is really me, and I'm going to prove it with how specific and accurate this is. Ananias didn't know where this man lived. That's why he had to be told. Ananias didn't know that Saul had even been kicked off the path and blinded by the resurrected Jesus. Ananias knew that, that Saul was sent by the chief priest to go torment and terrorize people who followed the way, people who were students of the rabbi Jesus. That's all that Ananias knew. And then the next thing you know, he's giving him Saul's address, and he's telling him to go pray for this man. This was a religious terrorist. Okay, let's just take away all the facade of language. Saul was a religious terrorist. He was going to kill people of the way. He was sent by religious leaders with their blessing to torture, torment, break families apart, and kill people who would oppose what he believed. He was a a, a religious terrorist, and Ananias is rightfully scared. I I don't want to go see him. He's got authority. The chief priests have given him the thumbs up. If he wants to kill me, the law says he's pure and clean. Good. Good want to go to his house. I don't know what kind of weapons he brought. I don't know what kind of entourage he has. I don't want to go there. I, I, can I be honest? I don't, I don't think I'd be super excited about that mission. Lord, is that really you? Is it, I mean, do you know who this guy is? Do you know what he's done? The prophetic gift demonstrates the accuracy and the knowledge of God and His supreme handle on every single detail in the universe. His supreme authority that He would know exactly and speak to one and He would speak to another. The same thing happens in Acts chapter 10. You've got Peter and Cornelius. And God speaks to Cornelius and says, I'm sending Peter. And God speaks to Peter and says, go to Cornelius. And God is working things out prophetically on both ends. So when he gives you the information, when he gives you the word of knowledge, when he gives you the word of wisdom, when he gives you the dream, when he gives you the prophetic utterance, when he gives you the vision, you better take it to the bank that he's already went before and done all the heavy lifting. He already blinded the terrorists and made him cry in a room for three days and begged for God to forgive him. And all Ananias' information that he had was that he was a religious terrorist coming to kill Christians, disciples of the way. And if Ananias would have been closed off, 
would have been had hate in his heart toward him, would have been closed to the reality that God wanted to transform Saul. But in the transformation, make no mistake, there was some difficulty for Saul ahead. I will show him. He's made my people suffer. I will show him how much it means to suffer for my name's sake. That's why Paul would later pen to the church at Philippi in Philippians 1, for it has been granted to you not only to believe, but to suffer for his name's sake. It's been given as a gift to suffer for the name of Christ. This is the reality. So when God reveals something to us, we need to be open to it. Just because it seems strange does not mean it's not God. That seems like a very strange word. Just because it seems strange, what God is asking you to do does not mean it's not God. Now we have to test everything and there's the three point test. But they didn't have First John back then yet. <laughs> we do. Uh, and the instructions surrounding it. But, but just because it feels different than what you normally would think about a situation, just because it seems different than what your expectation is of how God should react to that person does not mean that it's not him. Hallelujah. Are you open? Are you open to what he's going to say? Now, again, he's not, I've already said this, test everything. What are the tests? He's not going to violate what he's already revealed, but what he's revealed in, in his written word, he will apply through his spoken word, and he will give direction and insight to us. At the end of the day, all the Holy Spirit needs is our yes. All he's looking for is a heart that will say yes. I can think of Mary. People think, oh, what, a, what an amazing opportunity it would be to be the mother of Jesus. What I would give to have the Son of God be my child. You understand that it completely ruined her life. It was a blessing. It was a gift. But it almost ruined her marriage. If Joseph would not have been obedient to the dream and vision that God gave him, he may have left her. He was going to divorce her because in their culture they already had a marriage agreement and it was binding and you had to divorce someone if there was only certain grounds, which adultery or infidelity was one of them. And how else can you get pregnant? I mean, I, I love that uh, <laughs> Joseph's like, God, I'm trying to understand this, but this is pretty basic here. This is biology. I mean, you, 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 my wife's trying to tell me we've not known each other and she's pregnant. And it's you? Like, I'm out. <laughs> I'm done. I'm finished. So, Mary, her whole life is, her, her little perfect little engagement period and all the parties and celebrations have now turned to shame and communal punishment community hated what had happened and looked at them like they were disgusting every time they walked by. She then can't even have birth in her own home. She has to give birth by a feeding trough in a stable. She then has to flee because of a dream and go and live in Egypt away from all of her family until the massacre of the innocents has been completed and then has to come back and travel back. This isn't your raise your baby and have your family around and all the communal, it takes a village and let's all be in this together. They were isolated and treated terribly by the community. And then she gets a prophetic word. Hey, your, your, your son is actually going to pierce your heart. And what's going to happen to him is going to pierce your heart. And has to watch her son be excruciatingly uh, uh, murdered and executed in front of her. And then bury him at my age. Got really quiet here. Yeah, yeah, saying yes does not only always mean, hey, I'm going to go get a mansion and I'm going to go get this and I'm going to get this. But sometimes saying yes looks very strange. <laughs> Thank God Mary said yes. 
She's been counted blessed among all women. Blessed are you. Blessed to be a blessing. Abraham was blessed. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. Genesis 12, 1 through 3, the Abrahamic promise. And, and, and dreams and visions to him meant go take your son up Mount Moriah. That looks very strange. Yahweh, we worship you because you're not like the other deities who always demand human sacrifice. What are you doing? I've waited 50, 70 years. I was 90s. My wife was in her 90s when we had this baby. What are you doing? You're ruining your plan. Didn't you, weren't you the one who said this was your promise? And, you're, and now you're ruining your He just needs yes. I love that he just, Ananias said, you know what? I'm, I think you're making a mistake. Do you know who Saul is? He said, go. Just go. Just go. When Moses tried to argue with the Lord and say, I don't have these oratorical giftings. I don't speak well. I stutter. He said, did I not make the mouth? Go. What is in your hand? Just go. When Gideon was hiding in the wine press and, and scared of the enemies around, what is it that God said? Just go. I'm, I'm calling you who you are. Just, just go. Just, just go. And, and that's what you need to hear today. Just go. When he speaks to you, just go. Just do it. Just be obedient because that's the final key. Ananias was obedient. Write that down. Verses 17 through 19. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. Now, Ananias hesitated. He took a minute and said, this is real dangerous. I need to evaluate, make sure this is really you, God, because this could get me killed. And I'd prefer to come home and have a good reputation and be a man of God in the community. And uh, if, I, if I do this, I, I, I might lose my life. Okay, so, so I'm not, not aiming for that. Don't, don't want that. But then after the hesitation, once God said, nope, this is me, go, he didn't sit there and argue. He didn't debate God. He didn't sit there and say, well, if this is really you, I want you to turn the clock to 303. It's 301 now, and if it turns at 303 and I look at it, if I walk down this aisle, y'all have y'all done this before. I know I have to. If I walk back down this aisle and they're still there, then I'll do it. If, I, if, if they still need help in a week, then I'll, then, I'll, then I'll do it. If it doesn't get resolved in this time frame or whatever, then I'll do it. If there's still a hurt or a pain at that point, I, I'll reach out. If it still hasn't resolved itself, then I'll do it. It. God is just looking for some people who will obey him. Will you be a person who will just give an unqualified, unequivocal yes? Not debate. You know how this is going to end. Just look at Job. He started trying to debate God, and God said, you, okay, you want to debate me? You sit there like a man and take this. I'm about to wear you out. <laughs> Where were you when I laid the foundations of the... You just don't want to do, you don't want to get in that situation, okay? Now, God is gracious and kind, but sometimes he has to take us to the woodshed. Sometimes, yeah, and Ananias didn't get to that point. I really don't want to get to that point. I just want to hear the voice of God and just say yes. I want to discern. I don't want to be naive. I don't want to be foolish. But I, I, I really just want to have a yes in my heart. He walked in, Ananias and you know he's got to be concerned when he walks in. <laughs> like, what if this isn't God and I die? <laughs> like, what, what if I go get crucified by the Romans and because the chief priests say I'm, I'm part of this uprising with this rabbi Jesus? Like, what if I go in and reveal my identity and then there's no going back? I say, Jesus has sent me and it's a trap. I mean, I'm sure all these things are going through. I know that would be going through my mind. Like, Lord, I'm really hoping it's you. Because if not, I'm, I'm out. I'm out bad. Um, so, so Ananias probably enters with a bit of trepidation, maybe with a bit of uncertainty. But he also walks in in confidence. 
because he's a student, and immediately, the Bible says that he walks in and immediately puts his hands on Saul. He said, I'm on a mission. I don't have time for chit-chat. I don't have time for pleasantries and introductions. I'm walking in and I'm fulfilling this word or else I'm dying one or the other. I, I, I'm walking in. He walks in. He immediately lays his hands on Saul. And I've already spent time in this series addressing the laying on of hands in Old Testament, New Testament, very biblical. That's why we do it. That's why we believe in it. The laying on of hands for impartation, healing, prayer, etc. And then Ananias does the unthinkable. He calls a religious terrorist his brother. Brother Saul. And this messes with me. Saul's not done a thing to deserve being called brother yet. Saul's not demonstrated that he's a brother. He's not recited the creeds from memory. He's not been baptized yet. He's not made the public profession of faith that Ananias has heard. Ananias is just going off of a vision. And he comes in and he said, if God has called you a brother, if God has called you his chosen one, then you're my brother. I don't care what kind of false lines are trying to be uh, built up. He said, I, I don't care what kind of mission you think you're on. God's on a mission. And he picked you. And if he picked you, you're my brother. Brother Saul. Brother Saul. And he laid his hands on him. He welcomed him into the family. That's what the prophetic gift does. It gives you God's eyes to see people. You know what the flesh would want to do? Would tie him to that chair and torture him. Say, you killed my friends. You killed family members. You tormented them. You got them punished. And I'm going to do that to you. And nobody's going to know the better. You're not even going to know who I am because you're blind. The flesh would want to fight him and fight back and make him be punished for what he's done to your friends and your family and made them hide like rats in caverns and caves and ran them out of the public square, burned them as torches for their nighttime parties, threw gasoline and kerosene and all measure of flammables all over the body of Christians and burned them. Ananias says, brother, the Lord Jesus has chosen you. And you're my brother. Prophetic life and living a prophetic life allows you to see people through God's eyes. And it does not hold their offenses against them. It does not hold their wrongdoings against them. It gives you God's heart and God's eyes for them. Brother Saul, and he said this, I'm not just here for some spiritual things, which that's my primary mission. I'm here to see you filled with the Holy Spirit. But I'm also here to see you regain your sight. The Lord Jesus wants to heal your sight because it was only when he was blind that he actually saw. It wasn't until he was blind that he saw. It's the same with Samson. It wasn't until his eyes got gouged out that he saw. And his hair began to grow. And he said, Lord, just one more time. He comes blind and finally sees the truth. He finally sees the reality. Brother saw and the Lord Jesus sent Ananias for physical and spiritual healing. Because God cares about the whole person, not just the soul. Salvation is physical and spiritual. God cares about the healing of our bodies. He cares about the whole individual, not just the soul. Just thinking that we're a detached soul is a very Gnostic form of thinking that isn't biblical. It's the whole person that God cares about. And he says, I'm going to lay my hands on you, and you're going to get healed and see again. And then you're going to get filled with the Holy Spirit. Ananias then baptized him in water. He got the order all messed up. Sometimes God just doesn't care about our order and our systems and structures. He's like, I'm going to fill you with the Spirit, and then I'm going to dunk you in water. Uh, normally, there's a salvation, a baptism, a baptism in the Spirit, but sometimes God's just like, no, I'm just going to do it my way. And in the middle of Peter's sermon in Acts 10, they all get baptized in the Spirit, start speaking in other tongues, and even been baptized yet. He says, okay, I'm going to baptize you now, and then I'm going to get you some food. 
Because he's been fasting. See, Saul had been humbled and had received a vision from God. And living a prophetic life, he had some understanding here that, hey, he's hungry. He has needs. And I'm going to take care of those too. I'm not just going to pray for him and leave. Because living a prophetic life is more than delivering a prophetic word and walking away and not caring for the person. Living a prophetic life says, not only am I going to share the word of the Lord with you, I'm going to share his heart with you through my hands. I'm not just going to lay my hands on you to see you healed. I'm going to use my hands to make you a meal. And I want to see you strengthened again, not just in the spirit, but also in your body. In your own prophetic ministry, and this is where I'll land. Lucky, you can go ahead and come up, please. In your own prophetic ministry, you are not responsible for results. God is. You're responsible for obedience. All you have to do is say yes. You're not responsible to see blind eyes open. You can't make blind eyes open. Only God can. All you need to do is say yes and go and let him do that. You're not responsible to see, to to know the address of every person and to know exactly what situation in life they are. You just need to be connected and hear and say yes. All you're responsible for in living a prophetic life is obedience. If you go and, and you're obedient and it feels like a flop, that's not on you. Jesus went to the cross. I'm sure it felt like a flop when he died. Everyone around him thought he failed. Everyone. And yet it was only in the point that he thought he failed when God said, if you'll just be obedient, you leave the results to me and I will vindicate you and not let your body see corruption. I will raise you from the dead on the third day. And I will vindicate every single thing that you did because you were obedient to me and you drank the cup that I put before you. Living a prophetic life is not about seeing somebody break down in tears when you give a word or see them visibly move. All you need is obedience. And if you're obedient, you leave the results to him and you'll live a prophetic life. Let's stand together. Father, we want to live that kind of prophetic life. If you want to live that kind of life, I just want you to come to the front here. I just want you to make a, make a move here in faith and say, I'm willing for my life to be interrupted. I'm, I'm willing and I'm ready to just step into that. I just want you to come here as a sign, as a moment of, of consecration, as a moment of yes. I just want you to lift your hands to heaven right now and just say, here I am, Lord. Here I am. Here I am, Lord. I might not be the most gifted. I might not be the most qualified. But I'll be the most obedient. I might not have all the resources that I feel like I should. I might not have all the education that I feel. I might not have all the money I think I need. I might not have the stage of life that I feel like I should be in. I might be super busy. I might be super stressed. I might be super over. But you've got my yes. You've got my yes. Pick me. I'll I'll say yes, Lord. I'll say yes to you. I'll say yes. Father, I just bless your people right now. I just bless them right now with this unqualified yes. That they would feel the rhythm of your heart. That they would hear the message of your heart. And they would respond to it. Lord, I pray for those who are saying yes today. That you would begin right now. You would begin right now. I'm just going to come and lay my hands on some of you. You would begin right now just to unleash dreams and visions in their mind. Dreams and visions would begin to flow in Jesus' name. Dreams and visions in Jesus' name.
Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Dreams from above. Dreams would flow. Flow like a river, O oh, dream of God. Flow like a river, dream of God. Come and make yourself known through dreams and visions, Holy Spirit. Come and let your spirit flow in the hearts and in their minds, God. I just pray that every mind would be opened right now to hear, 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 hear and see your callings, your words, your flow. In the name of Jesus, I just speak your flow, your healing flow through, through, through every mind, every mind that comes longing and yearning to know you and to see you, Lord God. I just pray right now that in the night watches, Lord, you would begin to reveal in the watches of the night, you would begin to reveal your heart and your mind, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, and reveal the plans and the purposes. Come, Lord Jesus. Reveal your heart to each and every person saying yes to you. Yes to you. Yes to you. Yes to you, Lord. Come and reveal through the night watches in their hearts and minds, Lord. Dreams and visions would flow. Dreams and visions would flow, flow, flow like a mighty river that they would just start to rush in. And, and night after night, there would be encounters with you. There would be strong encounters with you that would shape the direction of their life and shape the direction of their family and shape the behaviors of their life, Lord. Let it flow, Holy Spirit. Let your dreams, your visions flow. Father, we say yes to a prophetic life. We say yes to a prophetic life, a life marked by you. So church family, today I bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that your mind would be open to receive revelatory information like never before, that your days and your nights would be full of revelation from the Holy Spirit full of revelation and encounter full 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 and that your heart would be burning with a yes burning burning with a yes yes before he even asks yes pick me pick me yes lord reveal it to me and i bless your hands and feet to go in the direction of his leading the direction of his calling that as you're sent out your hands and feet would be anointed by the power of the holy spirit that you would lay hands on the sick and they would recover that you would lay hands on those who have need and they would be made well that your hands would reach out and provide the needs of those in the community around the sphere of influence that you have that you would in fact be the hands and feet of the Lord Jesus where you are positioned to the king of ages immortal invisible the only God be honor and glory forever 